Hey, welcome back, everybody. Crackcast News is back for this week. This is the third week in a row that we're missing somebody. This week, uh, Dr. Mike is out, so I'm here Just with... when we need to do a detailed yeah, domestic know, exactly. political roundup. We really of... need him this week, don't we? Yeah, thanks for that, Mike. Dave is here. Josh is here. Uh, I'm John, and we're going to dive right into things. The big story this week, of course, uh, we're going to spend most of our time talking about the European elections. Very, very big deal. Lots of angles to talk about this week. Um, huge news all over Europe, of course. Uh, the rise of the far right. Cataclysmic earthquake, political earthquakes in, in the UK, in France, in Italy, all over the place. I've been, only an American could call an EU election a political earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> earthquake. <laughs> we need some cool sound effects for that. Who gives a fuck about MEP? I don't That'll know about that. 0. 0. 0.003 on the Richter scale. of eligible people voted. I think that's a big deal. That's a big turnout. So that's a serious turnout. Oh, for well, America. let's start with, in general terms, of course, <laughs> here in Poland, um, uh, the Law and Justice Party piece... Uh, uh, no, nah, I was going to say easily. One wasn't that. It wasn't a huge margin, but it was a significant margin, I think, as elections Fair go. Fair to say, if they took that percentage into the general, they'd have an outright majority oh, with, sure. without cookies. So, uh, yeah. uh, any surprises here? Didn't we know that they were going to win the elections going in? Yeah, because... I mean, um, sorry, Josh. Go well, yeah, no, more or less. I th- actually, what was what has been amusing me has been the uh, the maps that have been appearing on Facebook mm, yeah. this week, showing that kind of like, yeah, OK, peace did get the majority of the votes. But look where they're concentrated in the centre and east of the country, with the exception of Warsaw, obviously. And then whereas the western side of Poland, the obviously the more enlightened and European and uh, liberal side uh, opted for the uh, for the best. I don't choice. like those maps because they always come with the inevitable cliche about, oh, we're two countries. We're two countries. And they always do that. In, in, yeah, you should after every election, one. like in America, after every presidential <laughs> election, oh, look who voted Republican, look who voted Democrat. Oh, we're two countries. I'm well, really tired of that cliche. Whereas in your country, the Republicans have also been winning the local races, the state races. Uh, it's uh, We have covered many times, just to say it again for any fresh listeners, uh, in Poland, uh, the left, the PO uh, side of things, mostly control the local governments uh, in the major cities. The big cities. And, and in most of the country. Uh, so, yeah. Interesting uh, bit of uh, information here. Mała Polska, as, as a, as a, for the entire um, województwo, voted for peace. Uh, by a pretty significant margin, whereas the, in here in Krakow, the European coalition won. No surprises there. I guess we're 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 two countries inside of Małopolska, aren't we? Should we start by giving Greg a good kicking, uh, Mr. Shetnia? Yeah, Shetnia, the leader of the of PO, leader of the European coalition, um, isn't it time for him to step down? How many how many times can you get beat up at the well, polls? We and explain keep what your how job? many bullocks can you drop? What did he do wrong for us? You know, what did he do wrong? Go ahead. Well, he formed the European coalition with uh, the SLD and uh, the other left leaning parties in Poland, but but he is the leader of PO. All right, first and foremost, you know, he's the leader of one of the premium political brands in this country post communism, and. They had 19 European Parliament seats last time, and now they have 14. And now their coalition partners have celebrated uh, their uh, ascension to the European Parliament by saying, fuck you, Greg, nobody likes you anyway. Uh, Leszek Miller has made it very clear he will not be listening to anything PO uh, say about um, European uh, unity. So <laughs> they're left in this really stupid situation where they've teamed up with a, uh, a leftist party that are not going to be much use to them going into the general election. The SLD, for people that don't know, are very centrist. They're socially conservative and left-leaning in terms of economics and uh, public policy. But, uh, the, you know, they're talking about bringing in Bidron's party, who actually did oh, at, least, at least win a six percent. Yeah. And as everyone knows, there's no way the SLD are going to form a general election coalition with, with Bidron's party. Bidron was featured in The Economist last week, which is probably no doubt why he... <laughs> well, their stance on, their pro-LGBT issue uh, stance will, will not chime with the SLDs. Well, no, exactly. So they're yeah, building yeah. a grand coalition that cannot be built. Uh, all they're doing is chipping away PO support. This guy, Shetnia has to go. I mean, he is an absolute empty suit of a politician. Even for a politician, he's full of shit. I mean, I'm sure the knives are out at the PO offices. I'm not calling him his full name anymore. He's just Greg. <laughs> uh, to me, he's just Greg, well, and then he goes now. Greg Greg will, will have a different just job go. in a few months, for, for, for sure. You know, Somebody it's been embarrassing forward. since peace took power, how little leadership has been on the left. But wait, on the other hand, though, on the other hand, do you want that kind of change in leadership just, what, three and a half, four months out from national elections? A good question, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, speaking as a as a as a British citizen, uh, where you know we've always favoured strong, stable leadership. Uh, and okay, I can't really continue with this without cracking up 
because uh, what? strong, <laughs> strong, stable leadership oh, you had it has not it been be, uh, has not been particularly kind of a, apparent in my own country in recent times. Bring back uh, John uh, Major, uh, isn't uh, it? <laughs> <laughs> Underpants tucked into yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was spitting images. Oh, yeah, How are you yeah, getting any of these references? Some of our let's get back on track here. Some of our older listeners, possibly. John, give us some eye results. Who didn't Beata Shidwell get the biggest results in the whole country? This is really interesting to me. Beata Shidwell, former prime minister, she's going to the European Parliament. And you know who else is going? I don't know if you guys picked up on this. Uh, Magdalena Adamovich, widow of Pavel oh, Adamovich, the right. murdered mayor of Gdansk. Uh, what was that, in January? I think it was January that yeah, happened. Around then, yeah. So she ran and was elected easily on a platform of uh, wanting to combat hate speech. Now... Easy to make fun of, uh, but under the circumstances, given who she is, I think she got she got a pass for, from a, for you know from from criticism or whatnot. So you can't really just call her a silly cow, then, can you? No, that would be a, no, I would never do that, and I would never let you do that either. I'm sure you didn't just do that. But um, Beata Shidwa and Magdalena, Magdalena Adamovich going to the European Parliament. Um, this, you know, what this says to me this this shows the power of name recognition to me in any election, especially a European election where you know most of the people are. <coughs> anonymous to, to your average uh, voter, uh, a name that they recognize counts for something, even if they have no kind of positive association with that person. The fact that they recognize their name helps. It's, a, them it's an exceptionally basic uh, political revelation. But well, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. It explains like right now in America, you know, Joe Biden is leading the Democratic field. Why? Explains because people, why because every, people know his name. Every real democracy has political families for that exact reason. You know, uh, I mean, there is an element that, look, if you, you're you always more likely to do what your dad did for a living. That's just a statistical yeah. fact across any industry. But uh, name recognition is, is very much a thing. I don't think anyone... I looked this up. The monthly this. salary for European um, MEPs is uh, just under 8,000 euros. Let's call it 34, 35,000 Zwati a month. Uh, plus, what, plus the, I think it's... Oh, various uh, allowances. 3,400 euro um, undocumented allowance. It just gets paid into your account. Uh, so no matter just what. whatever. Expenses. Yeah. I, I might be up to four now. How many days a, a month are they there in, in session? Not many. Five, seven? Uh, it's low. Maybe at most one week a month. So let's call it $10,000 a month, essentially. And it's for five years. Is that right? Five-year appointment? So, uh, yeah. Miss Adamovich, I'm, and I, I, it's, it looks like I'm picking on her, but uh, maybe I am a little bit. She just got a ten thousand dollar a month job for the next five years, and she's there to fight hate. Now, I don't know if that's among the is your thing big with, priorities with, in Brussels with Adamovich or not. that her her position, even for a leftist politician, will be seen as hollow virtue signal, and if it wasn't for the fact of what happened to her husband, yeah, in so many words, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I haven't really had a chance to run over her uh, her credentials or her policies or anything, but uh, you know, I'll take a look and see if uh, see if there's anything there worth defending on that. We'll, we'll there is that kind of hysterical thing about manifesto, though, isn't there? And we, <laughs> you know, like that kind of you're supposed to have a manifesto, and that sets out. I always get worried when you laugh before a joke. That usually means I won't understand what the <laughs> fuck. That, that, what, what that means is that it's not actually a joke. It means I'm being serious because oh. oh, I'm getting right. the laughter out of the way before I go. So if, Josh, it's Josh, if you hear Josh laugh, it means he's serious. Oh, so. Um, so, I mean, you know, traditionally we've had it that kind of, you know, if you stand for election in whatever circumstances, whatever platform, that you have a manifesto and that states pretty much what it is, if you are elected, that you intend to do. Um, we had, you know, two of the main major parties in Britain kind of standing on a manifesto in the last general election, which they then kind of more or less abandoned. We now have extensive criticism of a party that's done very well in the European elections in Britain, which has no manifesto whatsoever. And they're being criticised for having no manifesto. And I'm beginning to feel that perhaps the manifesto is overrated. Well, I, uh, I believe a, a return to uh, manifesto politics will be greatly appreciated uh, across the world. The, the thing about a manifesto is it gives an interviewer something to beat a politician around and the head. Do voters read it, gives though? A, do they know what's in it? Well, in Ireland, yeah, people do read them. I mean, I'm sorry, but it, it gives the voter a great chance. If someone walks onto your door, yeah, you take the manifesto, you find a political fact that contradicts it, and you make that politician extremely uncomfortable no. for 10 minutes. Make them earn their money. Yeah, not every household is like yours, though, Dave. <laughs> no, I don't think that's Look, how it MEP, works at all. MEP is a kind of cushy gig, but usually it's somebody who's done councillor, uh, you know, what we call a TD, you call an MP, and then, they're, they, you know, then their party will put them forward for MEP. Let me tell you, two of them jobs I wouldn't do for any of the, all the tea in China. Uh, people that go on about 
you know, basic politicians having an easy life. Uh, you know, they could do worse than to read Parliament of Horrors by PJ O'Rourke, who, oh, while, great book. while mocking them endlessly, you know, has to admit again and again, this is not an easy job, guys. Can you imagine listening to people moan and having to agree with them, basically, again and again and again, week in, week out? That's when... Ah, uh, come on, uh, MEP, you, you know, it's once every five years. You get elected and then, you know, you just kind of you have to turn up from time to time. You know, you've clearly made the point that that's the easy one out to trade. The two oh, to trade, I'm talking I, I, my apologies. Uh, my apologies. I misunderstood. Member of party. Let's talk about uh, Robert Biedron and uh, Robert Biedron and his Viosna party. Six percent, just above the threshold needed to, you know, to to sit uh, in, in in Brussels. Um, isn't this a huge disaster and a disappointing, very disappointing result for his party? Doesn't he look like a prime Julian Assange before, you know, all the... <laughs> he all does the a little bit. Yeah, yeah, maybe he does. Yeah. really made he him does. look all uh, disheveled and mad. Uh, let me just say something about Beadron's party. At least they won some fucking seats. You know, it's a start. I think they won three seats, 6% of the vote. So, you know, it could have been worse. Not much, though. I think... Uh, with, with the fanfare surrounding the uh, launch of the party, what was that, in March? I will say, if you can't throw your vote away at a European election to a party like Beadron's, it's not a great sign, actually. I'd like to retract my last comment and agree with John. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rare occasion. On the Crackhouse News, though, anything so is what, you, possible. You think, you think that they are... Uh, a unlikely or a difficult coalition partner because they don't really get along with well, uh, other members trying to of build the broad, um, broad umbrella tent. Yes, exactly. So Shetney is trying to put three or four uh, nominally left parties together to make a block that can challenge uh, Peace and Cookies uh, should they band together again for the next election, which actually is unlikely because Peace are going to go for gold in the next election and try and get an outright majority. Uh, and Entirely basically, possible, yeah. basically, as I already said earlier, the SLD will not go into a coalition with uh, Bidron's party because the SLD are socially conservative and they will never swallow the uh, LGBT rights, yeah. uh, you know. Do you think, um, is, isn't this kind of one of the problems with the parliamentary democracy, a party that gets 6% that barely qualifies for Brussels could be in a kingmaker position? and enjoy the outsized benefits that come with that. I mean, Some would say that's the beauty of parliamentary I politics. Don't know, I don't think it's beautiful at all. The, the, the fact that the, the parties can change, that different groupings can become important, and quite often in parliamentary politics you get this amazing issue, especially in Ireland where we have proportional uh, representation and transfers, uh, that, uh, the smaller parties don't want to enter government. You know, They specifically know they're going to be wiped out in five years' time because uh, they'll have to agree to everything the majority uh, stakeholder in the government wants to, wants to do. They'll take their couple of minutes ministries and then they'll get punished by the the electorate. You say it's a weakness, John. I say it makes the third vote in the American system nearly useless because you can always make the argument that you're you're draining the vote, vote away from the Democrats. Oh, yeah, and no the system is perfect for sure. Definitely but, not. But a party that gets 6%, let's say they can they can extract uh, a, a major position, one of the big ministers, I don't know, finance, foreign minister, whatever, uh, various other concessions from the, from the larger the party. And for a party that got 6% of the vote, that's Did ridiculous. Clinton win the election or did Bob Dole cost Bush won the election? Uh, Ross Perot, you mean? Ross, Ross Perot, Perot that's the one. Yeah. Who's Dole? What, which one was that? He was the, he was another Republican he, candidate. He was the candidate in 1996. All right, so same argument, different race. Okay. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? You know, that's the that's the danger of not having that pressure valve. So at the moment in the UK, a party, the Conservatives, that have existed and been the, one of the strongest parties in European politics for, you know... A long, long time. What did they? Uh, a be? couple of hundred years. They were the. They were. They were. The, no, they were the Tories before they were the Conservatives, and they've continued to be the Tories as a sort of nickname. What did the Whigs become? Liberals. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Let's bring this back to uh, something we mentioned a Tourism. couple of minutes ago about what this means for the national elections in. I guess they're going to be in the end of October. We don't we don't know the date yet. Oh, they have a end of October, the beginning of the oh, Has the date been set? Yeah, I think it was. I read it was the 13th of October. Or okay. Well, anyway, um, given that's just you know just over four months away, it's not confirmed. But isn't that, this kind of more proof that peace is in a very very solid electoral position? And PO, uh, despite their complaining. Uh, has been unable to chip away at the lead. Anything can happen in politics. Anything. One story, anything can change. I remember there was a time not so recently where I thought the Chernetsky, the banking thing, might, might be one of them uh, drip, drip stories that uh, that kind of hurt people. But they never go anywhere. But yeah. It didn't go anywhere. Actually, I should address that. There was something I wanted to, to address about that scandal. And um, I know it was peace instantly doubled, uh, put a proposal forward to double the sentence for child molestation, which ties into that documentary, which went viral on, on YouTube. They react very quickly 
to electoral uh, impulses. Opportunities, yes. Now, I've painted that a couple of times on this show as maybe flip-flopping or maybe not being sure and kind of having to roll back. But actually, now I'm starting to look at it and think maybe they're just light on their feet and they're very sensitive to modern political optics. Uh, I thought it was quite clever the way they, they went straight after the sentence and thing. They were basically saying, okay, you know, we know you associate us with the Catholic Church, but that doesn't mean we support child abusers. Here's a double in the sentence. Don't try and pin that on us. Same with the banking thing. You know, they have proved quite agile in power as well. So I'm, I'm, I get that I'm kind of changing my mind for our long-term uh, listeners, but I think they're going to easily win this election. I don't think they're going to get a massive majority. I think they're going to win about 38% of the vote, possibly still need a, a minority partner, maybe if they go a bit lower than that. I wouldn't be surprised to see the same, the same uh, set up with cookies propping them up. Uh, but, you know, that's my, just my opinion. Politics can change in an hour. Let me get your take on uh, another aspect of this. Uh, I mentioned at the top of the show that the turnout was about 43%, which is pretty impressive, I think. And I just have the impression anecdotally from following this on social media that elections, may, certainly in Poland, maybe in Europe, I don't know, are are kind of, um, I would describe it as going the American way. And what I mean by that is that uh, suddenly it's... Uh, you know, you can almost hear Michael Buffer in the background saying, let's get ready to rumble every time the, uh, the elections come around. It becomes an event. And the Facebook generation is taking their selfies as they cast their ballots. Uh, suddenly it's, it's cool to participate in elections, not national elections, but European elections. And, you know, it's just becoming a, a, another, you know, a, a, a proxy for, for culture wars, a proxy for... Other the the, the left right divide in Poland is much younger than in other countries, and that's now developing. The the the, the fissures, the fault lines in Polish politics, become more pronounced. I think also there's been a kind of an un, unnatural emphasis on the importance of these European elections, which of course is particularly n- by John, <laughs> which is actually which is actually not very much as you know, like traditionally, kind of like voter turnout for European elections Shocking, yeah. is is like kind of in the low thirty percent. Forty three is pretty good. <clears throat> Forty three is very good. Is very good. Um, I mean, whether this is because, you know, never more so than right now has there been a lot of focus on the European Union and what it's doing and what it's going to hopefully continue to do or not continue but to do. But do you just do you, do you agree? I do agree. Just with anecdotally, you. that elections are becoming a big deal in the way I agree they, they weren't before. I think the pieces uh, um, elevation to power has has created a new epoch in in Polish politics. I think the the left right thing that's a t- that's a, a big thing in every country has become much more pronounced. In. You made a good point earlier, I thought, about peace being very quick on their feet to kind of, like, readjust their stance or kind of, you know, get up to speed. And I think I think that's very important. And I think that, actually, what's really happening is that the European elections are being used as a bellwether uh, for what may be happening next in individual kind of member nations in their own domestic elections. And... Uh, does any of you actually know what a bellwether is? And would you like me to take time out to explain to you? I really would. Okay, well, I'll tell you, because this is one of those things that hardly anybody knows. We need some I... theme music for this, but okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, well, we can work on that. Right, right. Well, okay, Be- bell hyphen weather. Well, weather a weather is a castrated sheep. <laughs> Yeah. But obviously, you I like it already. Knew, oh. you, you, you all knew that. Um, and generally, the, what, what you see, what it would be was that if you, in olden times, you had your flock of sheep, and a castrated sheep, a castrated male sheep, is not really much use for anything at all in terms of breeding or milk or or, or anything. So you'd stick a bell around its neck and you'd send it out at the front of the flock. And and if its bell started jangling kind of massively, it meant there was a wolf around and the flock was in danger and the shepherd could... Um, it was basically an early, early warning system. Well, and we use it as a kind of a sign of things to come. Uh, yes. And coming from the front of the flock and the wolves and... Okay. Right. So whenever people talk about a bellwether, you know what really they're talking Dave, about. exit cast- music for castrated. the uh, lesson. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much. That'll be the one. One last thing. One last question I want to ask about the European <laughs> European elections. Before <laughs> it's what music needed go. for this part? One last question about the uh, European elections before we move on to other stuff. On a macro level, I mentioned that you know huge important results in the UK, in France, in Italy. Um, it looks like nationalist parties are going to have about a quarter of the seat. And by the way, 
seven hundred and fifty something seats in the. I European thought you didn't like good. conservative God. governments being described as nationalist. They're far <laughs> right, aren't they? Oh, oh yeah, that's a far right about, nationalist. Let's say about they go a, together. Let's say about a quarter of the seats in Brussels are going to be held by parties with a similar worldview. That's not enough to get their Hold agenda on a through. Hold on a second. What? what? What is peace? Like, I mean, I've been asking this question for you. How would a far right government with those social? Parties? Of course well, they're, they're not. I mean, it's right. the most ridiculous kind of like no, inflation. Right. I genuinely think uh, there was an interesting article actually in DW. It was like uh, one of these uh, international. Uh, uh, journalists kind of waking up and actually, uh, you know, got, and, and it's like it's like it's a revelation to him four or five years later. He goes, you know, they use a lot of leftist policies, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's kind of like something we've been saying on this show since we started. Peace are a political hybrid; they're not a traditional conservative right wing party, not by a long shot. I mean, and that's why I think genuinely, you know, if you listen to this show regularly, you really should know by now is that they're a weird grab bag mixture new kind of formation of a party. Uh, right. I mean, they certainly have nationalist and populist elements, yes. but so much of what they do is kind of, you know, like socially on the left in terms yes. of kind of like welfare systems and, and kind of like high kind of public sector employment. Can I finish my question now? No, what was the question? Oh. Okay. Oh. So about a quarter of the, a quarter of the <laughs> seats in, in Brussels are going to be taken by parties with, let's see, a nationalist uh, flavor to them. Yeah. Again, not enough to push through their agenda, but definitely enough to block others. So does is this a recipe for, for stalemate, for getting nothing done in Brussels? No, it's, do you know what? Look, we, we, it's something we touched on when we had uh, the professor on the show. I, I believe, um, if you want to get macro about it, uh, <laughs> Uh, that um, traditionally in the last 20 years, coming up to say five years ago, politics in Europe was dominated by um, centrist parties who a lot of them were nominally left-leaning but had very centrist economic policies and that all coincided with the rise of globalization and a lot of the assumptions uh post 89 post end of communism that have held economically and socially are, are quite simply being challenged and i just think you're seeing a normal shift in parliamentary politics you know the left held power for a long time in poland and now the right were in power i don't think it's any more complicated than that well, it's um, just the, the pendulum swinging back and forth it, exactly john i mean there's a reason why if you look and take the last say 20, 30 elections in most countries, not, not in Ireland where Fianna Fáil just basically ruled for like 50 years but in most countries it swings one way it swings the other, people sure. don't like to let one side get too comfortable and it's something that we we say on this show a lot this is why it annoys us when people compare peace to Fidesz which is Orban's party, Orban's party is a 75% party, it is not anything like what Polish politics looks like, they do not, uh, peace do not dominate Polish politics the way they get written about in you know certain publications, which I won't start naming our All right, I think we're going to do everybody a favor and move on from the European elections. Yeah, and I would and like talk to say about to some our other listeners, stuff. Uh, oh, we're going to we're going to every make, time I try to move on, we're going to make. Mikey, listen to this. Even though he's uh, finishing off culling all those wild boars, the government called him in with a shotgun to yeah. uh, get the job fun- finished. And we're going to make him critique this and maybe pull us up on a few points because uh, there's no doubt he is our, our resident Polish politics. Talking expert. about you, Dr. Mike. Yeah. Okay, now can we move on? Possibly. Okay, let's go to something else. Let's get a quick bit of local news here on one of our favorite, our very favorite subjects that is uh, traffic, traffic and trams and pr- traffic problems. As if we didn't have enough headaches already with uh, Krakowska closed and Dietla mostly closed, soon to be completely closed. Uh, the city decided it was a great time to close uh, Rondo Matechna to tram traffic because, hey, fuck you, Krakow. <laughs> I think that's basically the thinking here. Um as if traffic weren't bad enough already, Dave, and, and you spend a lot of time in this part of the city, uh, back and forth to work, I think. Uh, as if it weren't bad enough already, now we're going to add this. It kind of makes me want to move back to a city where nobody's allowed to build anything because there's always 59 protests from uh, residents and uh, people of the legal means to stop anything being developed in their country. Yes, I travel along this route, and when you add in the, the, the disruption down at the Dila Bridge, Krakowska, and then a potential delay at Matajnego, which is just like one of the busiest junctions... Of of any city, yeah. and, and it has a ripple effect all over the region. Does it? It's all like that, the root out of the city as well. Like one, one yeah. thing I love is on a Friday afternoon, totally off piece there, but uh, I love watching people from all over Poland go home from these office buildings near Bernarka and they just jump on uh, it's this beautiful system where you can just pay you know 10, 12, 13, 14 slotty and get a mini bus that arrives once every 35 minutes and it'll drive you anywhere transport's so cheap in this country anyway well, uh, so terrible traffic. Though. You know, we keep every couple of weeks we add a place, a, a part of the city we we tell people to stay away from, 
and it's getting to be a bigger and bigger chunk of the entire city. Soon it'll be safe to, you know, to drive on some roads, a couple in Bianjano, one or two, maybe in Azore. And other than that, just don't go near the center of town. That's where we're headed. Creeping paralysis. The last time we yeah. talked about this, we, we asked if it was better to do everything at once and just get it over with. Uh, what, what, what did we agree on? I, I forgot. We agreed that that would be the sensible answer, but we've been paying in our hole with it all. Uh, yeah. and, and it just feels like... I've used this analogy a couple of times this week. It feels like living in the the era of some great emperor. You know, ever since we've moved to Krakow, it's been 15 years of uninterrupted building works and we could all use a break, but we'd love to progress. Well, if your daily commute includes a trip through or near Rondo Matechna, keep it in mind that uh, we don't have an exact date yet, but sometime in June, things are going to come to a standstill. So you might want to look into some other ways. To get to work or uh, school or whatever you do. Or take an extended holiday. Or just walk, yeah, or just get out of town. Yeah, exactly. Let's get some business news here. Interesting bit in the news this week about Bleak, B-L-I-K, Bleak, a payment system, mm-hmm. which is actually the product of a, of a kind of a coalition of Polish banks. They got a major investor this week, MasterCard. MasterCard is uh, stepping in to, to uh, complete the latest round of funding. This is kind of connected with an interesting issue. That is the, the existence of unicorns in Poland. Of course, we're talking about uh, investor unicorns, uh, privately held companies, worth a billion dollars or more. You know, as active and as vibrant as the startup scene is here in Krakow and in Warsaw and all over the city, we've yet to get a Polish unicorn. Uh, it's just a matter of time before we get there. A couple of names here in Krakow would like to be in that mix. Um, Brainly, um, Estimote. There are a few names that you might know that are kind of, you know, they aspire to the unicorn status, but they're still quite a ways off. Uh, guys, what do you think about uh, Bleak and MasterCard and, you know, going for that Polish unicorn? Well, the first thing to say is it's it's quite refreshing to see a story that mentions six banks teaming up and none of their customers are being uh, colluded against or robbed over yeah, We don't have to rates. be afraid or concerned. <laughs> yeah, basically, you, you got to give credits where it's due. The six major banks in Poland, uh, PKO, Santander Bank Polska, M-Bank, ING, Millennium and Alior all teamed up um, years ago and came up with Blick, which is, uh, if you've lived here, you'll, you'll know what it is. If you order uh, online any food, Uber Eats, um, Pizza Portal, any of these things, they take this online uh, Blick system. Lots of stuff on Allegro as well you can pay yeah. via Blick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's their version of PayPal, basically. Is that, you know, not even, it doesn't use a wallet, so it's... Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's much better... It's than, unique? I forgot to check it's, Well, it's much better than PayPal <laughs> because it's uh, it doesn't really cost you anything. It's just the money and that's it. Well, it's just interesting to me because it's kind of at the, at the crossing, at the, at the nexus of two obviously related fields that are just exploding in Poland, mm-hmm. and that's uh, e-commerce and uh, e-payments. Basically, I mean, growing like it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I think we all see an anecdotal evidence. How often do you see couriers uh, delivering stuff in your neighborhood, Dave? Constantly, They're constant, and that's you know those, that's e-commerce sales, and of course every e-commerce sales involves uh, an e-commerce uh, a payment transfer, and uh, Bleak and now Mastercard are right at the center of all of that. So. Uh, who knows? Maybe they will become the first unicorn. A billion dollars. You know, I get what people mean when they use the term reseller. You know, like you've bought something and then you're just trying to make extra money on its on its rarity. But it's just a seller. Oh yeah, pretty much actually. I mean, I think it's it, you know it's a fancier way of saying retailer, which which people have been familiar with for for, for a very what long. What are you time. talking about these e-commerce platforms? Yeah, no, I'm just talking about people who sell shit on eBay. What are they called resellers and not just sellers? Uh, are they called resellers? Yeah, I mean, that's the term people oh, use. I'm a okay. reseller. Well, because when I think e-commerce, I don't think individuals. I think company. You know, like the, the you know, Amazon obviously is the, is the big gorilla, but you know, the Polish versions of that, um, uh, Zulando, and you know, the, the different brands that uh, are very active online. You know, buying from manufacturers. Please that, tell me Zulando make a product called Blue Steel. Uh, possible. <laughs> anyway, not rising to that one. It's impressive that Mastercard have have taken the uh, the seven. Well, you know, to get on their radar, I think you need to have your 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 house in order. And you know, they do their due diligence, and before they put however many millions, you know, they 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 some very smart people who work for Mastercard kind of give the uh, give the green light to this kind of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, sixteen point five million euro is what their investment represents. 16 po- that's like that's, uh, that's how much money they spend every month on fo- uh, copier paper at Mastercard. I yeah, think. I mean Mastercard may just be hedging their bets buying chunks of uh, online payment systems uh, all around the world. Looking for the big payout but... when it does become a unicorn maybe. Possibly. Yeah. Well, one of them stories it's interesting, yeah. but you know there's not a whole lot you can say about it. 
Well, I mean, again, when you when you when when a, a Polish company gets that kind of attention from a heavy hitter like Mastercard, I think mm-hmm. you know it's worth a mention. Oh, and, definitely, uh, yeah, no, definitely worth a mention. And again, again, connected to the whole um, startup culture in Poland, which is you know very very active. And whoever does reach that first uh, unicorn status in Poland will have a lot to be proud of, I think. And just a matter of time, somebody's going to hit it. Uh, I'd be curious to know if it's going to be uh, a Krakow operation or a Warsaw operation, because you know Warsaw has. I think it's roughly three times the number of tech startups that Krakow does. Yeah, well, our but, castle's bigger, isn't it? But on average, <laughs> on average, the Krakow operations attract more money and bigger investments. Yeah. So, yeah, take that, yeah, Warsaw. Up in Warsaw. Get your own podcast. <laughs> Actually, don't. Tell all your friends. Yeah, listen yeah, to listen them. to the Krakowcast. Don't, don't get any ideas up there in Warsaw. Yeah, maybe we can do a special on Warsaw one week and try not to make it too kind of like acidic and jaundiced Have we used my nickname that nobody ever uh, picks up on? What? The, the Saw. <laughs> The Saw? Yeah, That's we should a great call Warsaw The Saw. That's a great nickname, yeah. Thank you. You won't well, use it, I guarantee do we, do we call Krakow The Cow? Moving on from <laughs> uh, The Saw and The Cow, I hear something from The Police Files. Actually, it's The Customs the Office The Police files. files. We should have an extra <laughs> uh, like series called The Police Files. And some sound effects for that. Not exactly police, but again, The Customs Officers. Now, this is a story about smuggling. Now, Ooh. is it smuggling drugs? No. Is it smuggling uh, people? No. Is it smuggling, I don't know, untaxed There's cigarettes? There's a lot of things in the world. Are you going to list no. them No. <laughs> this is a Polish thing. It's smuggling amber. 400 kilos of amber. Which is a record. Which is a lot. Now a record. 400 kilos of anything is a lot. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but uh, Now looking at your screen, how I'm, much is it worth in Zloty? Oh, God. You looked at your screen. I saw you. Is that no, a, I'm that passing though. it over to Josh. A street value. Street value. <laughs> Un, uncut pure amber. You were on about this last week. <laughs> no, I know. It's, it's a particular bet noir right. of mine. All right. Let's just assume you've chopped it all up into grams, <laughs> as you like to do, Josh. Give yeah. it to your distributors. How much, <laughs> how much is this 460 kilograms of amber worth in powder slotty, roughly? Give me a number. Uh, 400 kilos, I reckon. 460 kilos. 460 kilos, I reckon probably about 475 swatty. Wah, wah. Was that one of your famous jokes? <laughs> Would you not just take a serious guess? Like, it'd be more, it'd be more impressive when I say the Or you could just cut okay. the drama and tell us. 40,000 40, swatty. 8 million like. <gasps> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, this is interesting. I not always pretending to not be Not only shocked. because we don't often see amber smuggling stories, amber. but it's kind of tied into something I find interesting. You know, amber is a, a foundation of the, of the tourist trade in the sense that it's, it's the, one of the standard things that tourists pick up uh, here in Krakow. And, you know, go to the Sukhinitsa and you're going to see tons and tons of amber, all the side streets, all the tourist shops and whatnot. Amber does not come from this region. Well, um, it does wash up on the Baltic shoreline. Let's be clear about that. Oh, but, oh and by the way, uh, the story we're... we're, we're can I just finish? We're t- sorry, do we know where the amber came from? This, the amber in question, the smuggled yeah, amber? Yeah, it came from Ukraine, I think. Oh, I'm sure. Um, yeah, the, it was brought in. It was uh, the, the Lublin customs officers uh, caught it. But it was at the crossing at uh, Dorohusk in Eastern They Brown. have natural amber in Ukraine as well. Yes. Can I just say, though, the reason that um, there's not enough in Poland, and you're right, it is very popular here, is that the law dictates that you can only collect amber on the Baltic coast if it washes up naturally. So uh, people do walk up and down those beaches, and they do occasionally find a lump. Uh, Officer, I swear, I found it. It's 460 kilos. It was point, just sitting here. The point is, there's nowhere to mine it. You know, it's one of them uh, precious stones that, in, in Poland anyway, uh, it washes up on the beach, literally. I think we mentioned this before a long time ago on the podcast. Uh, amber... Again, one of the, the cliched symbols of the, the tourist trade here has no connection to Krakow. The reason the amber is here is because the tourists are here. The amber comes from Pomerania. I think it always just reminds me of Jurassic Park. I'm always the, looking for uh, a mosquito in me amber, you know, maybe start my own super race. Or a done. velociraptor, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. 460 kilos of amber, you might find a velociraptor inside. Hey, raptors. <laughs> Last thing we're going to mention, uh, had, had to talk about this, had to talk about this. A wild cow scandal. Oh, yes. Now, I didn't know we had wild cows, first of all. What's the story with wild cows? Yeah, apparently they're not really wild cows. They're just cows that nobody's tested. A bit pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Tell, tell us about the wild cow story, Dave. Well, there's two angles to this. Uh, <laughs> you know, first of all, the actual story, which is this dude, um, uh, Pavel uh, Skorupa, uh, who's told TVN that it's just his, his herd. He says, these are holy cows. Holy cows, just like in India. They wander everywhere. I do not agree for them to be slaughtered, nor oh. given away. This herd is mine. I absolutely disagree with this decision. There's 200 wild well, cows in western Poland somewhere, this little village. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. So President Duda has already expressed hope that a solution could be found for uh, instead of slaughter. Oh. So I, will you shut up for a second? Oh, oh, oh when I interrupt you, yeah. oh, see, I see how yeah, it works. Yeah, you're the host, you know. <laughs> I interrupt you, you, you be quiet when I talk, okay? Simple. Uh, I wanted to go back to a point I made earlier in the show, which was about pieces... Um, reaction to stories how as their their time in power uh, continues they seem to react to the optics of stories a lot quicker i think they've hired a, a twitter consultant myself and uh, we all remember it or just a tweet yeah well uh, we all remember when um the wild boar thing happened yeah Remember the story? We covered it. We did a special on it. You yes. were wearing your blue sweater. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think this is a reaction to that. I think they were like, we're not getting caught up in this bullshit again. Send Duda out and tell him he wants to save the cows, okay? And find out who's trying to kill these cows and tell him not to kill the cows. Because we got an election coming up and we can't have any dead cows in our conscience. Right. What do you think? So the, the real secret vote. to their yeah. electoral success, uh, whether it's domestic or European elections, is, is the, the cow factor. No, I'm making a broader point that unlike, no, you're right. unlike the boar thing, where they got dragged into this ridiculous argument and they had to actually justify the boar call and explain it yeah, to the, people. The optics were bad. Yeah, this time they, they try and get out of things a, a lot quicker, you know, in front of things a lot quicker. And it's a point uh, that we've been making. So a lot it's of. almost like they have somebody monitoring, like, you know, social media and the news sites, see what people are talking about and see how they can put themselves into that. In I a think good they way. make a calculation simply and quickly. Is this fundamental to who we are as a party? Because if it's not, we're not dying on this mess. I wonder, why was the default position to kill the wild cows? Why, why did they? Well, I think it was because they, they tested for disease. Yeah, yeah, they've not been tested for diseases. They're roaming freely and could potentially affect, mm -hmm. infect uh, non wild tame cows. Although it does sound a little bit like wild is kind of stretching the envelope yeah. of what wild really means. If you walked I mean, up, these are not like up to one of these feral, wild cows. feral cows that it's not fully wild, exactly. If you walked up to a wild cow, what would it do? It would probably say moo. It would just like, look at you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, um, you know, the the activist point is they've been there for years and years and years and never hurt or caused any concern to anybody. You know, uh, basically, it seems like the, the Skorupa brothers are right weirdos. They just, uh, <laughs> they seem to be enjoying the attention and jokingly refer to it as an, an organic farm. So you reckon that uh, that peace will benefit from the the love from the animal lovers? I think peace are just determined not to get dragged into another story like the wild boar thing. They, yeah. They've got their eye on the prize at the moment, and the prize is an outright majority. I don't know. think they're going to be pulling in the vegan vote in any great numbers. No, <laughs> regardless <laughs> of their stance. On I hope wild we can cows. see something about this uh, reflected in one of the campaign posters that I show up in Ireland October. In the world. We had a very funny little scandal recently where cows? our prime minister, as you guys call uh, at, on Taoiseach, uh, basically said, you know, to lose a bit of weight and to be a bit healthier, he was going to try and cut down on his meat consumption and got absolutely destroyed by every farm and lobby in the country. Oh, would you look at your man, huh? Sure. The big vegan yeah. heading him. How dare you, Leo? How dare you? The National Herald needs your support. How dare you talk that vegan shite in the radio? I mean, he's still listening to it months later. And I, he didn't even say anything about the National Herald or uh, farming or anything. But Do you have a National Herd service then? I think that's kind of... I don't know, but I love that yeah. term, the yeah, National yeah. Herd. Yeah, yeah. And we're always under pressure to reduce the size of the National Herd because of our global warming emissions. But then we make the point that we produce uh, meat more efficiently than any other country because we have lots of grass. So if we let other people grow that beef, it's going to be less efficient. Ergo, That's a what? very, very good point, yeah. Oh, it's a huge... But succinctly point. made. It's a political hot potato with a bit of steak in Ireland. Oh, God, I just oh, made a joke. Did there. Oh, very nice, did, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Did. I just took the worst joke of the episode. I uh, love you there, Josh. Thank you, you have it. European elections. 65 weeks straight, you found out. Unicorns. <laughs> Amber and wild cows, most importantly. That's Bleak. everything you need to know for this week. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you next time on the news. Oh, is there well, not one more? No, there's not one more. No, 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 no more, more interruptions. No, that's it. Seriously, done. Finished. Bye. We'll talk about all my other interests. No, seriously, in, uh, we're next, done. Next week. Yeah, next week. Okay, bye.